In this video, we'll use functional decomposition to break down a large method that creates a user interface into a series of smaller, more manageable, cleaner methods. For my example case here, I've created an application that will go out to Wikipedia and, for any given page, find the text of that page and then sort the words based on their usage. In fact, this is smoke and mirrors. All I'm really doing is returning a list of words from this set. However, for the sake of building and testing my user interface, I don't actually need a fully functional model underneath. That's part of the lesson of this video. You can write good view code while your model is still in development if you separate them well. Okay, let's look at this view code. This is the kind of thing that a lot of my students will start with. You have one method that contains all of the construction and control of the user interface. Now, we can see that white space is being used to separate logical ideas, and many of the chunks have comments that describe what they're doing. This reveals to us that in our minds, there's already a functional decomposition. We already think of these as separate pieces. However, the source code doesn't really reflect that, not in a structural way. So like a lot of good code quality practices or clean code practices, what we really want to do is match the structure of the program to the way we think about the problem. Let's start at the beginning. Here we can see that this code initializes the result area. So what happens if we just take this out and say create result area? Now I'll use alt enter to uh, stub in that method, paste in the code I copied, and we just need to declare this variable. And of course return it at the end. Okay, so now we're saying there is a text area called result area and we're going to create it. Good. We don't actually need that comment anymore now because this has become self-documenting. All right, can we do the same thing with the button? Well, let's see. Let's take this out and say create search button. Again, using alt enter just to stub this in. Okay, now once again, this is uh, completely self-documenting, so we don't need that. And in fact, we don't need a break here because it's pretty clear what each of these lines are doing. This gets a little more interesting. In the UI, we have these two pieces. Well, let's run it again and take a look. These two pieces go together, the label and the text field. The two of them are put together into an H box, which is a horizontal box that just contains all of its children. So. Let's take all of this, and it's helpful to know that there's a class called uh, Node, which is the superclass of all the JavaFX elements or widgets. Um, so let's just call this uh, control, let's see, query area is what it's called in the comment. Let's try, try using the comments here to guide us toward good naming. Um, we're going to have to import this and then stub in this method, paste in that code. And all we really need to do now here, I think, is return that hbox. It contains the, the label and the field. Uh, hbox is a subclass of node. Um, notice that because we're using node here instead of hbox, we could actually make this a grid panel or something else if we wanted to. Um, so we're using the power of subtype polymorphism here. Uh, and that creates our query area. Again, we can just pull that out and that's looking a little tidier. Now we get into the actions and things get a little more interesting because we have to deal with some of these variables that previously were within this scope but now are local variables within our utility methods. The fact that this is needed tells us that it should probably be an instance variable instead of a local variable. So let's find that query field. Here it is. Let's just take that and make it a field of main application. Uh, in fact, it's going to be a little tricky to try to make that final here, so I'm just going to leave it as a regular instance field. Notice that this is instantiating it here when we say create query area. And so now we can reference it here. So that solves one of our problems, but I didn't actually read the code to see what it was doing. This block of code ensures that the search button is disabled while there's no text in the query field. So, 
Really, this is about configuring the button. Let's move this logic into our method that's designed to create the button then. That makes more sense. It's this method's responsibility to create that button, and part of the button's behavior is ensuring that it's only enabled when there is text in the query field. Because we made query field into an instance variable, we can access it from this method as well as we can in this method. Good, I call that a good improvement. So here is the logic that says when the search button is pressed, we generate a query, and then on a separate thread, we execute the query. That gives us a result, which is, in our case, a list of strings. In order to modify the UI again, we have to use platform.run later to ensure that this code is run back on the UI thread. This is a standard thing in JavaFX. Who should ensure that this is attached to the button? Well, it seems to me like that should be again in that same method we were just in, the create search button. Now, in order for this to work, it needs to have access to the result area. Well, that makes sense because one of the primary components of this user interface is really that result area. So let's do the same thing. Let's find where it was uh, created as a local variable, and let's make it an instance variable. Good. Now, when this is created, the instance variable value is set, and we can reference it here. The query h box has gone away. That is now query area. And we can go ahead and trim this up too. So what is the start method doing now? It's creating these three parts, combining them into a v box, and then putting them on the stage. That's pretty short and it's pretty tight. Although to be honest with you, I still don't like the fact that this is creating the elements and this is populating the stage in sort of the JavaFX plumbing. I would like to pull these out and say, there is a UI that I'm going to create. Now, instead of this being the vertical box itself, it's this UI reference. And now, in my mind, there's no ambiguity here. What do we do when we start the application? Well, we create the UI. How do we create the UI? Well, we make the three main parts and we put them together in a VBox. How do we make those parts? Well, it's functional decomposition. We can go to each of these pieces and see how they're created. Now, of course, doing that refactoring is not the only step. We need to review this code to ensure that it matches our standards. One of the problems that we've introduced is temporal coupling. Let's take a look. In order to create the button, the query field has to exist first. This is a great example of temporal coupling. I have to call create query area before I can call create search button. This has to exist ahead of time. But there's nothing in the code that enforces that. This is an undocumented dependency. One thing we can do is follow a standard defensive programming technique and put in a check here. So we can say require non-null query field. Now this doesn't strictly enforce the sequence of calls, but it does ensure that if we end up here and we haven't done the prerequisite call, we'll get an error message. Now, if you follow that logic, we can look down here and say, well, do we have the same kind of problem with result area? Not exactly, because there's no way to click the search button before the whole UI is created. And this is asynchronous. Right? This code doesn't happen right away. We're just attaching this listener to the search button. So I'm less worried about this. In fact, if result area were null, that would mean we missed a major step in our code and it would give us a null pointer exception anyway. Okay, let's run the application and see if our refactoring worked. It turns out it doesn't. Let's take a look at the message. We get a null pointer exception, query field must be created before the button. Well, look at that. We actually ran into that problem that we foresaw by reading the code. So let's restructure the code to make this work. We need to make sure 
when we create the UI that the search button is created after the query area. Okay, let's try again. That looks good. Again, let's read through the code real quick. We can see each method is pretty short. If we're counting lines, remember that these event listeners that are being added here are really different classes. So if I were to say how many lines of code is create search button, well, I would think of it mentally this way. But I also want to make sure that each of these other pieces, whoops, each of these other pieces is also short. Let's apply this idea of functional decomposition in one more step. Look at the application again. When I type in text here, I'd really like to press enter to do my search, but right now I don't have any event listener on this text field. I have to click the search button. That's kind of awkward and unnecessary. I think it's very natural to press enter at the end of typing a query like this. So let's make it work. Well, where would we do that? Well, if we look at the structure of our program, we would expect that to be done in the query area. Here is where the field is set up. And it's pretty easy to add an action listener that would listen for that event. So we can say query field set on action. We'll use a lambda here. So we can say when enter is pressed, which triggers the action on a text field, well, what do we want to do? Well, it, it's really this, right? It's the same thing again. But I don't want to copy and paste this whole thing. So let's pull that out into a new method. Alt enter, create method. A nice private method here to execute the query. And that's what we'll do here too. In fact, because this is a single line action, we don't need the braces here. And similarly here. Not only does that prevent us from repeating the code in two places, it also makes this again more self-documenting. What is the action attached to the search button? Execute a query. We don't have to go through and read the code and understand all these pieces and think, oh, that's executing a query. No, instead, we use functional decomposition to make the code self-documenting and sensible. I hope you found that useful. Remember, any time you have a large method, you can break it down using functional decomposition. If you think about how that code was set up before we refactored it, notice that I used comments and white space as indicators of where in my mind there were separate pieces. And now I've made a program that represents explicitly what those separate pieces are and what they do. Happy programming.